In 1887, Heinrich Kurtz discovered that if you shine light on a piece of metal, then sometimes an electron would be ejected. He couldn't explain it for 20 years almost. He couldn't explain why the observations that were made were made. But then Einstein comes along in 1905 and comes up with this photon theory, this particle theory of light, saying a photon is a quantum of energy. That explains beautifully why the observations that were made with the photoelectric effect were made. Fast forward just three years to 1908, and this guy named Arthur Compton notices that if you take a photon that is really, really high energy, like an X-ray, let's say, right, like 10 to the 18 hertz, something like that, if you shine that photon on a piece of metal, you will get an electron ejected, but you will also sometimes get another photon coming out of the mix as well. So it's kind of like the photoelectric effect plus the photoelectric effect and another photon ejected in addition to that electron. But here's the deal. That second photon that was ejected, Arthur Compton noticed, was less energetic than the first photon. And that might not seem like a big deal to you right now, but classical physics, classical physics we define roughly as pre-20th century, so pre-Einstein. Classical, pre-Einstein. Quantum, post-Einstein. Classical theory would predict that if there was another photon coming out of this mix, it's going to be exactly the same as the first photon. But that didn't happen. The observations, like they often do, contradicted classical theory. Hertz's explanation of the photoelectric effect was classical theory. Hertz said that the intensity of the light is the energy of the light. You want, more, you want an electron to be ejected? You need more intense light. That wasn't right. That was classical theory. That was pre-Einstein. That was incorrect. Einstein, photon theory, quantum theory suggested that light's a particle and that correctly explained the photoelectric effect. Well, classical theory didn't explain this at all. Classical theory said the second photon would be the same as the first photon. So, how do you explain this second photon being less energetic? How do you explain that? Well, Compton suggested that when a photon strikes a piece of metal, Here's my piece of metal with an electron in it. When a photon strikes a piece of metal like this, and that electron is ejected, and that second less energetic photon comes out of it, He suggested that that's really just a collision, just like we did back in February, collision between two baseballs or a collision between two vehicles at an intersection or the collision between two football players running down the football field. It's really just a collision, except this time it's a collision between a photon and an electron, right? Now, how did we deal with those collisions back in our first unit? What do, we, what do we do to solve them? If two cars hit each other and you wanted to find the final speed of the, of the second car, what would you do? PI equals, equals PF. So Compton argued that this is really just a collision where energy and momentum are conserved. Okay, not, doesn't seem groundbreaking, right? But it is. Okay, there's a big deal here. There's a big, well, a big apparent problem with this. There's not really a problem, but it seems like there is. And that is that photons, uh, Compton is saying that photons have momentum. I want to put a big question mark by that though, because how can photons have momentum when photons don't have mass? What's the equation for momentum? 
m, m times v, right? p is equal to m times v. How can photons have momentum when they don't have mass? We'll deal with that in just a second. But understand that his explanation here is going to work. And his explanation is a quantum explanation as opposed to a classical explanation. It is a post-Einstein correct explanation as opposed to a pre-Einstein incorrect or incomplete observation or explanation, I should say. Well, let's take a look at how we can have that momentum even with no mass. What's the equation for momentum again? You guys told me just a minute ago. P is equal to m times v. So let's write down that basic momentum equation here. P is equal to m times v. There's our problem, right? We don't have any mass. But Compton, in his argument here, drew from Einstein. Even though Einstein didn't come up with his explanation, he drew from something that Einstein said back in 1905, three years prior. Einstein said that energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing, kind of like ice and steam. Not exactly, because that's two different states of matter, and energy and mass aren't two different states of matter, but it's kind of like that. Ice can be converted to steam, and you lose ice. Steam can be converted to ice, and you lose steam. Steam and ice are two different forms of the same thing that can be changed back and forth between one another. Einstein said that energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing, they can be changed back and forth between one another. The law of conservation of energy, not quite true. We can't create or destroy energy. Well, kind of, we can, kind of. We can create energy, but not from nothing. We can create energy from mass. We can actually, well, not really destroy energy. Okay, we don't, if we get rid of all our energy, it's not that we're destroying it. We're just changing it to mass. So we can convert energy and mass back and forth from one to the other. If we have a pond full of water, of liquid water, with no ice in it, we say that we have just water, right? But we could figure out the equivalent amount of ice that it would be, right? Knowing the volume of ice compared to the volume of water, we could figure out the equivalent amount of ice. Even though there's no ice, we can figure out an equivalent amount of ice. Even though a photon has no mass, we can figure out an equivalent amount of mass in terms of energy. The equation that Einstein used to determine the equivalent amount of energy mass is called the energy mass equivalence equation. And that is probably the most famous, maybe the least understood physics equation ever. Anybody know what it is? E equals mc squared. The equivalent energy is equal to mc squared, c being the speed of light. What we're going to do here now, what Compton would have done, is taken that equation, rearranged it, solve for m. So this would be, this would be the amount of water in the pond. This would be the equivalent amount of ice. We don't really have ice in the pond. We have water. But we can find the equivalent amount of ice that we would have in the pond. We're going to sub in the equivalent amount of ice or the equivalent amount of mass into this equation and get this. Momentum is equal to the energy of a photon divided by the speed of light times V. So no longer do we need the mass of a photon. It doesn't have any mass. But it does have energy. And since energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing, we can sub in an expression that replaces mass, an equivalent mass, E over C squared. Now we're going to simplify this a little bit. What does V stand for? Speed. Vo actually, we should be velocity. Yes, you're right. Um, the velocity of light, right? The velocity of light or the speed of light can also be given besides by the, the, by the letter V. It can be given by the letter C. So let's replace that just so it's a little tidier here. Right, we're just replacing this with this. And then we can actually cancel out one of the C's. Now we're left with P is equal to E over C, right? 
Now on our data sheet, that looks a little bit different, but it is on our data sheet. On our data sheet, it looks like this. E is equal to P times C. The energy of a photon is equal to the momentum of a photon times the speed of light. Well, we also know that energy is, of a photon is hc over lambda, agree? E over energy over lambda. P is equal to hc over lambda over lambda. Energy, E over lambda. Uh, sorry, not over lambda. Should be over what? Energy over C, right? Energy of a photon divided by the speed of light. We can simplify that too, though. The momentum of a photon is h over lambda. That's on our data sheet as well. In the top right-hand corner. You want to find the momentum of a photon? Use one of those equations. You want to find the momentum of a proton? What are you going to use for that? Josh? Of a proton or, or of a baseball? M times Z. M times Z, right? Protons have mass. Like, it doesn't change a thing. Everything we learned up until today in terms of momentum involved mass. So P is equal to M times Z. Now we're dealing with uh, momentum of things that don't have any mass. Well, if you're dealing with that, then you've got to use one of these equations. Both of those equations appear in the top right-hand corner of your data sheet. So does this one, by the way. E is equal to mc squared appears in the top right-hand corner as well. There is one more equation that appears in the top right-hand corner that's relevant to this. And it comes from two laws. We're not going to show you how to derive it here. It's, it's a nasty one to derive. It comes from the law of conservation of energy and conservation of momentum combined. And it looks like this. Delta lambda is equal to h over mc times 1 minus cosine theta. Don't worry, you don't have to derive it. But you do not have to know where it comes from. You do have to know where that it comes from conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. Photon number one strikes the metal, electron ejected and photon number two also ejected. Photon number two is less energetic than photon number one. Right? If it has a smaller energy, it has a smaller frequency. If it has a smaller frequency, it has a bigger wavelength. Delta lambda stands for the increase in wavelength. And that's going to be measured in meters. The wavelength of the photon increases because the energy decreased. H is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. For all of these, all of the stuff that we're doing here on this board, use 6.63. Go joules. Go joules or go home. Okay. It gets even more confusing now because there's more situations where we have to use joules. Hey, if you're any question, what should we do for this or anything else? Always use joules. What do you think M is? Mass of what? Mass of what? Well, you got a, you got a, two photons and you got an electron in here, right? What mass do you think you're going to use? The mass of the electron. 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. C is the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And theta is the scattering angle of the photon. So the angle at which the photon scatters in degrees, of course. It's an ugly looking equation, but it's really not that bad actually when you go to use it. We're going to do two examples right now and then we're going to shut her down. The second example is going to use this ugly looking equation, but you're going to see how it's, as I say, it's not as bad as it might seem. 
Real quickly before we do those examples, listen, we have four properties of waves that, that show the wave nature of EMR. What are they? What shows the wave nature of EMR? Refraction, diffraction, interference, and polarization. Remember those? We now have two properties of particles that show the particle nature of EMR. They are the photoelectric effect. Okay, that showed that the observations in the photoelectric effect demonstrated Einstein's photon theory must be correct. What do you think the second one is? The Compton effect. Example number one says, calculate the energy and the momentum of a photon whose wavelength is 600 nanometers. Circle that because we don't want to be in nanometers. Uh, energy is easy, right? This is, this is nothing new. You could have done this days ago. The energy is just hc over lambda. And you know what? Because we're solving for energy, it doesn't really matter. Joules, electron volts, doesn't really matter. But if in doubt, if in doubt, exactly. I'm going to use joules, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds times speed of light. That gives me three.